Sean Faircloth. I just uh, am so impressed uh, with this organization, which again, correct my memory, but uh, uh, our host was telling me uh, it, that uh, this began four decades ago or so, that we really got... 75, but you've been involved for four decades or so, even though you were only five when you started, right? Uh, since 1969. I just think since 1969 that we really ought to uh, offer another round of applause and thanks for your service. And, your Thank you. and, and I do want to uh, say a, a bit of thanks uh, to be here even listening to me, the big kahuna, Ed Buckner, is here. And uh, Ed, to me, uh, basically my first day on the job, I went to our board meeting and Ed was there representing American Atheists. We have 10 member organizations in Secular Coalition. They were just joining. And just seeing him that day for a, a board meeting that might have gone a couple of minutes long. But whenever there was a, 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 a bit of wit, a, a, a bit of levity, it, it was coming from Ed. And, and I feel that, uh, you know, he's, he's really uh, the Mark Twain of American atheism. Mark Twain used to be the Mark Twain of American atheism, but he's not available, so we have Ed for us. But really, I, I just think it's so uh, important in this movement, you know, that you hear the stereotype, right, about, well, atheists, they're really mean and grouchy, nasty people, and so forth. And if there is anyone that I have met since I've had this job that embodies the kind of graciousness and kindness and good attitude and positiveness, it's really Ed. And I really think we have a tremendous leader and we should all give him a round of applause. And I know that I have a lot, every time I talk to Ed, I learn a lot. And I I'm, I'm, have a lot more to learn. And just because I'm the new guy on the block, I definitely have a lot to learn. I just got this job, like I said, in, in June. And I learn something every time I, I go anywhere. Um, I got to go to the Creation Museum in Kentucky, where I definitely learned a lot. I went with PZ Myers, go to the Creation Museum, and, and they had it there on a beautiful, well-made sign that explained how the dinosaurs got on the ark, because it involves cubits, your forearm, I'm not sure. But anyway, arcs aren't so big, and the dinosaurs get on the ark because they were baby dinosaurs. It says it on the plaque. It must be true. I w I'm convinced. I really, I was impressed by the evidence and a uh, beautifully made uh, museum. I started a children's museum in Maine. I just want to uh, talk about this for a moment. I started a children's museum in Maine. Maine is sort of the West Virginia of New England. We are a poor, cold state, not a lot of cash. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to start a children's museum. I had no qualifications to do such a thing, but I did. And we raised for Maine, a lot of money. We raised about four and a half million dollars in Maine for this, this project. And so in that context, uh, I go to the Creation Museum. In our museum, we were really proud of it. It was the second largest children's museum in New England, 21,000 square feet. Go to the Creation Museum, 70,000 square feet was the size of this facility, this Creation Museum, really telling kids things that were just so anti-science that you really do want to pause and think about where we are in America and what we can do as citizens to really bring things back. So I do learn things. I tell you, it was an experience going with P.Z. Myers, for those of you familiar with P.Z., um, uh, throughout this museum and learning a lot. And traveling in this job, I get to go to different parts of the country and being, you know, a kid from uh, Maine, uh, you definitely learn different things in different places. I went to uh, the Big Easy, went to New Orleans and enjoyed that experience quite a bit. You think things kind of loose in New Orleans, right? Uh, but you know, in Maine, actually in my hometown in Maine, we have Stephen King, right? And Stephen King, uh, some people think he's kind of scary because he writes about demons. But in Louisiana, they have Governor Bobby Jindal, who believes 
in demons, actually says that. Uh, it has participated in exorcism. So which do you think is more scary? I don't know. I'll take the main, the main version. In, in Louisiana, also got to learn from Senator Vitter of Louisiana. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Senator Vitter. He's the one who will very adamantly lecture you about your sexual morality while he goes to whores at the Mayflower Motel, Hotel in D.C., right around the corner from my office. I'm thinking, geez, we can't even afford that in our expense account at my office. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, and I'm, I'm pretty libertarian about all this. I mean, whatever Senator Vitter wants to do, that's, I don't know, it's not my place uh, to get involved. But it does give me pause, and it especially gave me pause when I heard this quote from Senator Vitter of Louisiana. He said, I'm not making this up, he said that opposing gay marriage, opposing gay marriage is so important that it would be more important than if Katrina and Rita were to get together and, and come upon Louisiana. And I'm thinking, geez, just me, but I thought Katrina was sort of a big deal down in Louisiana. That's one thing. And then I also thought Katrina and Rita getting together, aren't those two females? <laughs> I don't know, Senator Vitter. Could, could be a problem. You know, so I, I'm concerned on his behalf, but you know. So I learned a lot going to Louisiana, I learned a lot there. I went to Iowa, and there we had a learning experience where, and this for those of you who might be registered Democrats, uh, the Democratic governor of Iowa was asked whether atheists have the same free speech rights as other Americans, and the Iowa governor said, well, I don't know, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. You learn a lot uh, going around the country, and unfortunately we learned things in my home state of Maine. Just this last month we had, uh, unfortunately, uh, a loss for equality on gay marriage in the state of Maine, and I gotta say, myself, I was majority whip, I did serve 10 years in the Maine legislature, know a lot about the demographics of our state, and I was hopeful that equality uh, would be successful in the state of Maine. I was saddened to see that it wasn't, but again, it goes sometimes. You have to go back, uh, as, as Jess Unruh said, money's the mother's milk of politics. That there was a lot of money coming from the religious right against that in a very small state, and that we need to be uh, equally motivated on behalf uh, of justice. So when you go around the country, you learn a lot. Of course, here in Michigan, what we got uh, Representative Stupak right here in, in Michigan, you know, talking about his uh, issues. And, you know, for me, I saw the other day, some of you are probably familiar with the book The Family uh, and what's written about C Street and all those people. And I saw that the representative said, well, I just sleep there. I don't know anything about what they're doing. I have nothing to do with it. And the author, uh, Charlotte, uh, of, of the book said, well, that doesn't really jive with my understanding of that organization that, you know, his involvement was more significant. Uh, representative Stupak's involvement was more significant. But okay, all right, if that's what he wants to say, that he's had no involvement. But it still gives me pause, because to me, I have this theory that people who are members of the United States House of Representatives might read stuff, books, things like that, and they might be familiar with what C Street is about and with what the family is about and with the uh, plan to have religious domination, right-wing religious domination of the American government. And so I guess for me, Representative Stupak, that you'd sort of think, even if you aren't directly involved in their activities as he so claims, even though he's offered this amendment that we're all familiar with, that you might say to yourself that being literally in bed with that organization is not such a good idea, that you might want to speak out for the citizens of our country just because it's the right thing to do. But I'll tell you, the first thing I'm going to start out with is the Bible, because I know almost nothing about it. Um, really, I, you know, I go to these conferences and people are experts on Darwin or they're experts on the Bible. The only thing I know about the Bible uh, is what I read in the children's Bible on the family vacations when I was a kid. Uh, you know that children's Bible has like the fake leather binding cover and it's purple and uh, uh, reddish lettering. And I was on that trip, you know, where you're fighting with your sister about who's, you know, on what side of the seat in the back seat of the car. And I said, all right, you know, driving through the desert someplace, that's kind of biblical. So I'm going to read the Bible. And I was getting through that Bible, and I get to the part, my dad's driving, and I get to the part where it says uh, that God instructs Abraham to kill his son. And then it implies that that's a good thing, and that it would be a good thing to do that. So I'm looking up at my dad and hoping he's not too faithful of a guy. You know, this, this could be kind of a problem for me. You know, from my perspective as some 12-year-old kid in the backseat of the car, geez. But it was really the first moment in my life where I really had that moment of pause. I said, huh, you know, 
First of all, one, would it be moral for a god to instruct someone to kill their child? And would it be moral for a parent to be willing to follow a directive to kill their own child, even if it's only a test? And then third, and perhaps even more strikingly, are children some form of, of chattel, some form of property that can be used in religious sacrifice? So I want to think about that story, and it's, it's a story that's part of our culture, and compare it to something in real life that happened in this century in the United States of America. There was a girl named Amia White, and Amia was two years old, and Amia, like most kids in the United States today, they attend childcare, right? And she was in childcare, and the folks at the childcare lost track of Amia White, and she was left alone in a van in Alabama in the sun for two hours, and Amia White's little heart gave out, and she died. And on the outside of the van were painted the words, Holy Church. Because you see, this child care was a religious child care. And in the state of Alabama, they have an exemption for religious child cares from health and safety laws of that state. So picture two child cares side by side. Child care number one, secular child care, has to obey medication segregation, keeping Joey's medication away from Susie's medication so you know whose is whose. Religious child cares are exempt from that law. Food safety regulation apply to secular child cares. Religious child cares are exempt. Child staff ratios apply to secular child cares. Religious child cares are exempt. All of these different types of laws have exemptions for religious child cares. But listen, don't worry, because the president of the Alabama Christian Coalition said that the pastors in the congregations are our quality control. So we're all set there. But to be fair, maybe it was a fluke, an anomaly. But there was a boy named Demiron Lindley. Demiron was three years old, and he was in a religious child care in Alabama. And they left him alone in a van in the sun for 10 hours, and then he died. Now, deaths are rare, but neglect of these children is rampant. It's all over the place, and there's no one to regulate it. There's no one to find out, because with secular child cares, they do inspections. There are no inspections for religious child cares. You can't even find out what's happening uh, to these children. Even in my home state of Maine, which is not a state dominated by the religious right, we have a statute that says that not you, not you, not you, not any of you, but if someone says, I'm religious, and I want my child to be exempted from vaccinations, that if that child goes to a small child care, they won't vaccinate that child, they'll vaccinate the other children. Now, that endangers that child, and endangers the children that come in contact with the ch that child, and it endangers the public health of the community. And it's a special law that only applies for those who offer this religious assertion, and that's in the state of Maine. And you might be thinking with the Alabama example, well, that's, that's the Bible Belt. But there's actually 15 states that have these kind of broad exemptions, going beyond Maine, the kind of broad exemptions that I'm talking about uh, that exist in the state of Alabama and endanger a lot of children.